That's all right. I think we're streaming, so we'll try to get started in a minute. We'll see how uh, reliable USB-C is here. All right, that's a good sign. Let's see if I can. All right, uh, we'll go ahead and dive right in because we are at time, or a little over. Good turnout. All right, the uh, topic today is Rook and Seth in the Home Lab. Um, maybe I'll do a quick poll. So how many people, so first of all, first question, anybody using Rook or Ceph currently? All right, so you, got, you can give the talk. Uh, who here is fairly familiar with Kubernetes? Okay, and anybody here play around with distributed file systems in general, things like? Okay, all right, so we've got a smattering of backgrounds here. All right, so my name is Rich Freeman. Um, kind of a, a weird combination of backgrounds. I um, actually have a background in biochemistry. I work in trade compliance, uh, which has nothing to do with this. And uh, I am a Gen 2 developer and uh, tinker with open source, uh, much like probably most of you. Um, just a little background about me. Uh, my first introduction to Linux was like way back in 1994. Um, I got a book in a bookstore, back when those were things, um, and there was a little CD in the back that had a Slackware install. Um, and uh, they actually, it was, this was a Linux file system at the time, but you could actually run POSIX on top of like FAT16. So you didn't, didn't care about the 8.3 file names, you just had like this metadata file in every directory. It was very, uh, very retro. Um, in terms of more recently, I've been using Rook for about a year, um, and I've been using distributed file systems for about seven years. So I'll, I'll give some background on the talk itself, um, try to get everybody up to a, a similar place in terms of uh, background. And really the focus of this is, you know, Ceph at home, why might you want to use it? Um, just an overview of the architecture of Ceph, um, and some things to think about before you run it at home. So hopefully everybody learns a little bit of something. Um, let me uh, just disclaimers up front. So what this talk isn't. Um, I try not to make this the traditional introduction to Seth talk um, because first of all, there's a ton of those on YouTube and they're really good. Um, and you know, the sort of the, the best practices for Ceph in the enterprise are not necessarily the best practices at home. Um, this also isn't a step-by-step, -step, you know, go install Ceph when you finish this. Um, this is more, why would you want to use it? Um, I will say that if you are using Ceph in the enterprise, um, there, is, there are a lot of options out there, actually. They have great reference hardware. There's a lot of integrators. Um, you know, Ceph is competing with, you know, storage solutions by companies like EMC and so on. You can actually save a lot of money using it. 
Uh, the only thing I would suggest is don't cheap out on it if you're actually using it in production. Um, you can save a lot of money and still have a very high quality install without going cheap, um, which is what I did, uh, which is what you probably will want to do at home. So this is an example. Uh, this is the, probably the best picture of a Ceph cluster I could find on the internet. Um, people don't tend to publish photos of their Ceph clusters in production. But this one is apparently 20 petabytes, 100 gigabytes per second. Um, this is the sort of thing that Ceph was designed to do. Um, you'll find it at places like CERN and other you know, really large uh, installations. So what I am going to focus on is giving you an overview of Ceph. So you'll have a general idea of what it is and what it does, um, how it fits into the storage landscape, um, kind of what its niche is, um, and then, you know, if you wanted to use it home, why is that, and how would you go about it? So this is, this is more the, the scale that uh, we'll be talking about. This is actually my Ceph cluster. Um, it's just a bunch of small form factor PCs, mo you know, combination of giveaways and used, uh, a lot of USB 3 hard drives. Uh, you can't see it, but there's a fair bit of flash storage inside those as well. All right. so. Let's step way back. What is a distributed file system? Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a lot of features that distributed file systems tend to have, but at its most basic, a distributed file system pulls storage across many hosts, um, typically over a network, um, and it makes it available to clients. So you have many, many servers, many clients, uh, and the storage is pooled as opposed to something like a, um, you know, a NAS device or something, which is typically one host with many clients. Ceph itself, uh, I pulled the definition off of Wikipedia. It's an open source storage platform that provides object store, block store, and file store um, built on a common distributed cluster foundation. So I will get a little bit into the architecture and all those elements. Um, there are some keys there that are really useful. Um, you know, object store, block store, and file store all in one platform is really nice. Um, all of that is accessible in a distributed fashion, assuming your clients are Ceph aware, uh, which the Linux kernel is. Um, it's designed for scalability, which is why there are so many really large enterprise deployments. It was basically architected to not have bottlenecks which allows it to get really big. Um, some things I also really like about it is they, they sort of have a, pri they don't sort of, they have a priority on data integrity and high availability. So most of the design decisions, um, the, the latency isn't the priority as much as the integrity side of it. So if you're writing through replicas, things typically block until all three are written and not the first, and there's a lot of, decisions that kind of go into it like that. Rook, which I'm also talking about, is a Kubernetes-based orchestration for Ceph. Um, it's very typical to orchestrate Ceph because there's a lot of components and it has strong authentication, which means that all of these components have shared secrets and they all need to talk to each other. And setting all that up manually is definitely possible, but probably not something you want to do. Um, the other sort of recommended way to do it is um, a program called Ceph Admin, which I haven't used, but that's basically the way to sort of do Ceph on bare metal. Um, there is an Ansible playbook floating around which does all this, and I've never seen so much YAML in my life. Um, <laughs> and uh, Rook. Rook is probably, I mean, Ceph Admin and Rook are really the main ways of doing it. I don't know which is more popular, but Rook is, is newer, um, but certainly gaining popularity. Um, and some of the features of Rook itself is the orchestration layers. It provides the CSI, although you can get the CSI without Rook. Um, it provides um, custom resource definitions for all Ceph resources. I'm not sure if everybody knows what a custom resource definition is, but basically it's a way of abstracting uh, entities. So you can abstract your cluster, abstract a file um, system, abstract a block store, abstract a 
S3 compatible bucket and things like that. Uh, and Rook does provide to all three modes uh, the block object and file store um, underneath. So some challenges of home storage and how Rook helps address them. Um, so the more traditional way to do um, home storage is a NAS, um, you know, often running ZFS or something like that. Uh, there's nothing wrong with these solutions. They're actually, if you're going to run like a NAS, I would definitely run it on Linux or BSD on ZFS and something like that. Um, it's very simple. Uh, it performs really well for a single host, you know, within that constraint of what you can do with one host. Um, one of its constraints is most consumer hardware these days has pretty limited I.O. If you look at a modern PC, not a lot of PCI Express lanes. Um, they rarely come with a ton of SATA ports anymore, and obviously you can add a host bus adapter or things like that, but you're typically limited to how many drives you can cram into a single host. And if you want to optimize a single host for a lot of drives, it really constrains your options. Um, and then as far as high avail availability is concerned, uh, it's RAID. You know, that's the closest, you know, because that's what you can do within one host. So you're protected if a drive fails, but typically if any other comp component of the host fails, you're not, unless your host is like a mainframe or something, which, you know, those things just never die. Um, a distributed file system basically gets around all these constraints by expanding beyond the single host. Uh, so, even if you can only cram half a dozen drives into a host, well, you can have 10 hosts, and now you can have all the drives you want. Um, the redundancy is now at the host level. So, instead of having RAID being, you know, mirrored disks within a host, now it's mirrored hosts within a cluster. So, now you can pull the plug or anything on any single host in the network, and it, nothing happens. Um, they often support high availability, uh, meaning that you can take a host down and not just not lose data, but nothing goes offline and your clients are all fine. Um, this varies, we'll go a little bit into some of the alternatives, um, but the open source options with high availability are a little limited. Uh, and I will also say that there's more learning opportunities in distributed file systems because it scales to the enterprise. Um, I would say that um, it's more applicable to the enterprise. Some alternative options. Uh, so MooseFS or its fork LizardFS um, is probably a pop, somewhat popular one at the home lab scale. Um, actually, Zach did a talk at last self about it. I, would, I, I assume the recording is online. I would recommend seeing it. Um, it actually performs very well at the home lab scale. It's, it's a, something to be seriously considered. Um, one of the limitations is the open source version of it does not support high availability. There is a licensed version which does support it, and they charge quite a bit for it, because that's a feature that the enterprise is willing to pay for. Um, there's limited uh, Kubernetes CSI support. So it, uh, LizardFS or, or MooseFS is fundamentally a file-based um, file system. Um, and there is a way to get to it with Kubernetes, but it's not nearly as extensive. Um, I will say the security is very limited uh, on this. I don't believe there's any authentication within the cluster. I think there's some ways to do IP-based controls, kind of like NFS from 30 years ago. Um, Gluster is a, you know, I mentioned it because it, it was probably the most common distributed file system. Um, it's very much declining. I believe it's kind of being end of life. Um, so I would not seriously consider something new. Um, I know it's been considered by many as very complex uh, in comparison. Um, I have not used it personally, so I don't want to denigrate it too much. Um, Another platform that's out there, and they've presented it past selves, I know I've seen around, is TrueNAS Scale, uh, although the scale part was Gluster. And again, I suspect they'll come up with something else. Maybe it'll be Ceph, maybe it'll be something else. Um, so it's definitely worth keeping an eye on, but I probably would wait until they figure out 
where it's going. Um, the other one worth mentioning is Longhorn. If you're on Kubernetes, this has been, become very popular, well, I mean, relatively speaking, in the last year or so. Um, it's fairly new and immature. Um, it's a pretty appropriate to the home lab scale. I'm not sure how much I'd want to trust my enterprise to it. Um, one gotcha with it is I don't know how much you can do with it outside of Kubernetes other than running a pod that gives you, you know, Samba or NFS or whatever on top of it. Um, my, my guess is it will not scale as large as Ceph will. Uh, actually, I'm pretty confident it won't scale as well as Ceph does, but um, that's not going to be a concern at home. Um, so let's talk about Ceph then, uh, some of its pros and cons. So big pros, high availability. Like I could take my Kubernetes cluster and reboot, you know, drain and reboot every single node sequentially and all the other nodes remain online. Um, it provides block object and file store. So um, there's applications for all of those. Um, they have a priority on safety and sanity, which I find very helpful. Um, like when Rook is doing things like scanning disks, by default it's not going to touch a disk if it detects partitions, if it detects a Ceph file system or formatted drive. Um, that doesn't belong to this cluster on there. By default, it's just going to leave it alone until you tell it to do something else and so on. Um, their release management strategy is very production oriented. They sort of have a long term, um, sort of stable sort of release model that you might expect to see in the enterprise. Uh, some cons on the right side Ceph is definitely more IO per second focused. Um, than, say, something like MooseFS. Um, so MooseFS, you can have half a dozen nodes in your cluster, and all the disks you're going to read at, like, you know, 100, 200 megabytes per second if they're hard disks. Uh, Ceph will not. It does a lot of seeking, um, a lot more random I.O. So if you're running on solid-state storage of some sort, that's not a problem. If you have a lot of hard drives, that is also not a problem because collectively hard drives gain IOPS. Um, but for small scale on spinning hard drives, it's kind of so-so. Another really big gotcha is that the nodes that have the storage on them need a lot of RAM. Um, sort of the minimum, there's recommend, recommendations that are higher, and if you're running like block store with a lot of VMs or something, I would have more for caching. But really the minimum you want to be safe is about two gigabytes per drive. So if you have 10 hard drives, you need um, 20 gigabytes of RAM, which means that you can't really use things like Raspberry Pis to connect your drives um, to your cluster because they're just not going to have the RAM. Um, another gotcha is you really need three nodes minimum um, if you're just using replicated storage. Because of how like its most RAID-like mode works, you really need 3x replication and not 2x. Um, and I won't get into the reasons why, but suffice to say bad things happen if you don't have at least three nodes. Um, and if you want something like erasure co coding, so like a RAID 5-like striping or RAID 6-like, uh, now you're talking more like um, six nodes. So you need a lot, you gotta expand horizontally before you start building vertically. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it demands orchestration. I mean, you don't have to orchestrate it, but you're, you're gonna want to because there's just a lot of components to be updating without some sort of orchestration solution which is, again, why Rook is so popular. Um, and also, in the case of Rook specifically, um, you know, it kind of becomes married to your Kubernetes cluster. So unless you run a cluster just for storage, if you want to change your Kubernetes cluster, like you want to go from K3S to Talos or something else, and this thing's running your Rook, um, you can transplant the storage without having to restore from backup, and I've done it. It's like a 35-step 
process that you're going to be kind of sweating through. Um, it actually works. It's got sanity checks, but it, it's definitely a, a weekend project. All right, let me talk a little about some of the components. Oh, and by the way, please do interrupt with questions at any time. Um, and I have some pretty diagrams that kind of illustrate some of this stuff. Um, so some of the major components of Rook, so there's the Rook operator, this is obviously part of Rook itself, um, which provides the orchestration within Kubernetes. So this is like a lot of other things you run on Kubernetes. There's an operator pod that sort of, you know, monitors all the custom resources and monitors for changes in the cluster and so on. Uh, there's a Ceph manager daemon, which is sort of the Ceph side of the orchestration. This does things like, oh, there's a lot of really random things it does. Um, this exists even if you're not using um, Kubernetes. But, um, yeah, I'm trying to think off the top of my head one of the things it does. It, it, there's, there's actually a bunch of little things it does. Um, it's actually not necessary for high availability. So if this goes down, your cluster keeps running fine. It's more for managing changes and things like that. Uh, monitor nodes. Um, oh yeah, please go ahead. Uh-huh. Okay. Oh, that's a common way of having it. So uh, I'll repeat the question for everybody, but, uh, but I just, just to clarify, so are you saying, are you doing like Luke's or something like that on the OSD to encrypt the drive? Okay, yeah, so he's saying one of the things he likes about, uh, and I actually do the same thing, um, is he can run Luke's on his OSD. So basically his hard drives are encrypted, and he's got a Luke's layer on top, and then Ceph is ingesting the encrypted Luke's device, um, and so your drives are all encrypted. Um, Rook actually, in theory, will do that automatically for you. Um, I found it sometimes is buggy and won't actually work, um, but that's definitely something you can do so your drives are all encrypted. Uh, there's also ways in Ceph to do encryption more at the client level. Um, it's, I, I, I haven't used it. I'm sure it works fine, but then you obviously have all the key management and all the, the issues you'd have with that. Um, all right, so uh, one of the Ceph components is the monitor, uh, which basically manages cluster membership. It just tracks metadata, and this is what provides high availability. So you'll typically run like three of these or five of these or something like that. Um, object storage daemons, so these are the actual daemons that talk to the hard drives. Um, there's a Rados gateway component, which basically gives you an S3 gate compatible gateway for your object store. I'm actually going to come back. I'll, I'll go over this when we get to the diagram. And um, metadata servers, which are used to implement uh, the Ceph file system uh, capability. All right, so let's talk a little bit, and I'll, I'll put those things on, on some, we have some pretty pictures of them. So here's, here we are in the release timeline. You actually can see we're kind of on the verge of a new long-term stable release. I just snapshot this like a week or two ago from the, the Ceph website. Uh, Reef is the current version of Ceph. Quincy was the previous. Quincy is still stable, um, but eventually, I think it's Squid is the new one that's coming up. That's going to eventually release, and Quincy will kind of become deprecated. The, um, uh, you'll find, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people are still running Quincy. You know, the, the, the large production users tend to lag probably at least six months behind. Um, there's actually some nice telemetry data online. You can actually see how many people, at least who publish their telemetry or on what version. Uh, it's actually kind of scary when you see how, how much data, how many, because it's measured in exabytes. So how many exabytes are on one version versus another. The architecture. So Ceph itself is built on an object store called Rados, which you can see here at the bottom. 
And then all the other capabilities of it are basically applications that run on top of it. So Rados is sort of the native Ceph object store. And then there's, there's a library you can directly access this if your application is sort of Ceph native. Um, and this will get you the best performance for sure if your application is Ceph native because it doesn't have to go through anything. Then um, there's something called Rados Gateway, which basically speaks Rados to Ceph and speaks S3 to applications. So if you have an application that uses S3 buckets, you can run this. And um, it's, it's a little bit more bottleneck because it's going through a gateway. Uh, but this actually can be sharded as much as you need to, so it, it can be somewhat distributed. Uh, RBD is, I forget what the R is, but the BD is block device, probably Rados block device or something like that. And this is your, your block store. So this is supported by the Linux kernel. Um, so you can basically get a block device that basically underneath it is just creating objects and storing it in Rados. And then you have Ceph file system, which is a POSIX file system. Um, there is a Fuse and Direct Linux kernel support for this as well, so you can mount this just like NFS or SMB or whatever. Um, this is a little more bottlenecked because the way the metadata and the locking and that sort of thing works has to go through um, a metadata server. And so each file system there are some limits. I mean, they're not going to apply in the home situation, but if you're running this in the enterprise, you're, you can only write so much I.O. to this to a single file system, um, and that's because of the POSIX capabilities. If the block devices, on the other hand, are you know, super scalable um, because all the metadata and the POSIX side is all done on the client side with those. And then Rook itself, um, Basically, Rook is, on the consumer side of it, um, you have the CSI, which is providing uh, persistent volume claims. Typically, these are going to be read-write once for the block devices. Um, that's probably the most common way. It's going to be your best performing way. Um, you can get read-write many persistent volumes, and that's going to use CephFS underneath, uh, which will then allow multiple things to mount the same volume at the same time. Uh, but that's going to, because of all those locking and POSIX issues, those are going to be a little bit more contention. And then you can get S3 clients uh, as well. Uh, Rook provides an operator that orchestrates the whole thing. Every node is going to run the CSIs. Um, that's just how Kubernetes works. And then you have monitors, managers, metadata servers, and then at the bottom you have all your OSDs that actually do the storage. So I'm going to, any, uh, any questions so far? I'm going to talk a little bit about how Ceph actually works. Um, now, there's whole conferences on Ceph, so this will only get so far. But basically, as I, I talked about, natively, Ceph is an object store. So Rados is the object storage layer of Ceph. Um, basically, all the data is stored in pools, and pools are basically like namespaces, so they're isolated collections of objects in Ceph. Those get sharded into placement groups, so maybe this pool might have 256 placement groups in it where objects just kind of get hashed and distributed across those, and that's just so that you know, they can be scaled down. And then there's an algorithm called crush, which can use, be used to map a placement group to a collection of disks where it is stored. Um, and sort of the, really this, is, this crush algorithm is sort of the magic of how um, Ceph operates. Um, basically, any client, if it knows the configuration of the cluster, which of course doesn't change very often, so it just needs to know how many disks there are in the cluster and some other things about its global settings, it can independently determine what disks a block is stored on. So when it's going to write to a block device, it can determine what its object number must be. It can, it can cache from the monitors the configuration of the entire cluster, and then it can do the math, figure out what daemons have the data, 
and then directly contact those demons to retrieve it. And so the sort of the orchestration and the control layers of the cluster only are needed to authenticate clients in and to sort of cache the, the state of the cluster and communicate that when it changes. But when you're just doing random IO on the cluster, the clients don't talk to anything except for the actual demons controlling the disks directly. And that's why it scales so well. Um, there, there are no bottlenecks in the design. Some considerations when you're deploying Rook. Um, so there's a couple ways you can deploy Rook. Uh, it's Kubernetes-based, so of course there's a Helm chart for it. Um, I personally use manifests, uh, but you can install it either way. Um, some, another thing you'll have to decide is are you running on bare metal or are you running on PVCs? So you might wonder why am I gonna run Rook on top of PVCs? Because the whole point of Rook is to provide PVCs. Um, the, the typical implementation here is if you have a cloud provider that sort of has very limited um, capabilities around their PVCs, so maybe they can give you PVCs, but maybe there's limits on how big they can be or your ability to do snapshots on them or whatever. Um, what you could do is basically consume your cloud storage into Rook and then re-expose it as a new layer of PVCs to your applications and now your, your application isn't you know, constrained by the limitations of your cloud provider. Um, likewise, maybe, uh, maybe your application is half on Azure and half on Google and another bit in Amazon. Um, you know, those, the APIs and everything for those PVCs are gonna all be different, but in theory, Rook could consume them all and you could actually have a cluster that runs across multiple cloud providers and Rook could actually run across all of them. That, that sort of a thing is another application in the cloud. Um, probably not so much for home lab. Uh, the other choice you have to make up front is where the networking, how the networking works. Are you using cluster networking or host networking? So um, this is just like a service or anything else you run on Kubernetes. Basically the IP addresses either could be internal Kubernetes pod IP addresses um, or they could be the IPs of the host and directly exposed on the hosts. I would suggest if you're gonna directly access Ceph from outside of Kubernetes, like you wanna mount your CephFS on a Linux host um, outside of the cluster or otherwise directly consume Ceph resources outside of Kubernetes, that's gonna be a lot easier if you're using host networking. Otherwise, you're gonna have to create a whole bunch of services and things to re-expose all of those um, IPs because, because there's no bottleneck, anything that wants to uh, mount a CephFS has to be able to talk to all the individual demons in the cluster, and so they all need externally routable IPs. Uh, one other, um, just a few caveats. Um, I mentioned if you want to move Rook to a different cluster, um, it requires a lot of manipulation, so I would be fairly confident that you have Kubernetes set up the way you want it before you stick Ceph on top of it. Um, it's definitely possible. I've done it. I moved it from micro Kates to K3S, um, and it all came up. <laughs> but it, uh, it definitely uh, is a lot of manipulation. Uh, another area, and this was of interest to me, I think this would be of interest in many home labs, is... In theory, it'll work on ARM, um, but again, you need two gigabytes per disk, and on ARM, getting a lot of RAM is definitely a limitation. Uh, the other obvious limitation on uh, ARM is if you wanna run like uh, NVMe or something like that, getting the, the PCI lanes on uh, ARM is gonna be hard as well. And I think that's it for my canned slides. Um, I have a, a Ceph cluster up and running, we can kind of tour it a little bit and do a little show and tell. Uh, if anybody has questions, um, feel free to ask. Why don't, we, why don't we do a few questions? I don't know if anybody has the microphone. Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat. 
Yeah, so uh, the question was, all this stuff in Rook that's inside the cluster, how easy is it to get outside the cluster? So there's a couple, and he, he suggested, like, can you just export it via NFS or something? So yeah, there's, there's a couple ways to go about it. So there's some facilities Ceph itself provides, um, like iSCSI, there's a gateway to go from uh, RBD to iSCSI. Um, so if you have iSCSI clients, uh, that's real easy to do. Um, for NFS, there's nothing native yet, but they're talking about adding that as a core capability. You can obviously run Ganesha or something like that in Kubernetes and just consume your storage as a PVC and create a giant file share for whatever. Um, CephFS itself, is directly supported by Linux. Uh, and there's also, I think, Windows and I assume OS X uh, clients for it as well. Um, so as long as you create a user and all the IP addresses are accessible, um, and I, I do this myself, I have CephFS mounted um, on, directly on Linux, you just need to create a client, user ID and credentials, put it on the client, tell it what the monitor IPs are and everything be accessible and you can just directly mount it. So CephFS, um, it works kind of like NFS in that you, know, you just can mount the same thing in 20 different places. It kind of works kind of how you would think it would, but it has the advantage that because it's distributed, the, the metadata operations all have to go to one server, but the, but the data IO is spread across all of them. So if you've got like a 10 gigabit pipe to your client, um, you know, it can go, it can pretty easily saturate that if you have enough hosts for it to the IO to get distributed among. Yeah, go ahead. That, that's a great question. So his question is, do your nodes have to be uniform? Do they have to have basically all the same drives, same drives types, same drive size and capacity and so on? Uh, the answer is no. Definitely you don't need to, although you would think you would from when you interact with people on mailing lists and places like that. Um, you know, the, the reality is that enterprise deployments tend to be very uniform because they're buying, you know, they're buying one use servers that are all configured the same way and they're gonna buy a hundred of them. So they tend to have fairly uniform layouts. You do want things to be reasonably balanced and that's because of replication and how RAID works. So if you have one node that's got a hundred terabytes and the node next to it has one terabyte and the one next to that has one terabyte, well, if you're using 3X replication, you can put one terabyte across all three but the one's gonna be 99% unused. Um, and the, out, the, the way the hash algorithm works, they, they may want, it, it may struggle to optimally use all that space, but it works. Um, I try to keep things reasonably balanced. Uh, in terms of uh, device classes, uh, in Ceph, the concept is device class for things like HDD versus SATA SSD versus NVMe and so on. Uh, you can have as many of those as you want, and then typically you define a rule that a given pool will typically only use one device class. Um, I mean, you don't have to, but it wouldn't really make sense to mix NVMe and hard drive in the same you know, bucket, because it's going to go as slow as the slowest node, and so you're just spending a lot of money for NVMe's and throttling them. Um, but you absolutely can do that. And in fact, I, my block storage is all on NVMe, uh, my CephFS actually split across pools. A, a lot of the capacity is in hard drive. Some of it is in solid state. Any given file is in one or the other. And I'm kind of trying to switch over to NVMe over time. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so, so the question, that the, the short version was, what's the quickest way to shoot yourself in the foot? Which I, I love the, that, that phrasing. But the question is, can you do things like have 
one on flash and two on hard drive or other sort of mixed configures. So you absolutely can do that. Um, it starts to, if you want your rules to be very elaborate, you have to get into this very arcane sort of language for defining those rules, but you actually, Ceph is designed to handle things like multiple data center scenarios and things like that. Now, where you get into trouble is if you had like one NVMe and two hard drives for a replication, you'd probably, you obviously you'd want the reads to all come off the NVMe and things like that. That can be a little tricky to, to set up. Um, that's actually something that newer versions of Ceph are incorporating as features. It, um, Ceph can do a lot, so I'm hesitant to give you a hard answer to that, but you would definitely want to kind of research. You yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so there's no, there's no hyperconvergence or anything like that. So Rook doesn't know to run your, schedule your pods on the same host that the storage is or anything like that. And in fact, it'd be very difficult to do that just because of the way the hash algorithm basically tends to chop everything into a gazillion pieces and throw it everywhere. Um, you're, so a read is obviously going to go as fast as the slowest retrieval. It only needs to retrieve one copy of anything. So there might be three in the, in the network, but it only needs one to, to, to assemble the block. Um, so I don't know how the math works on that, but it's basically... Yeah, unless I would tend to think, obviously, if you have like order of magnitude, like you put, took an NVMe pool and you stuck one hard drive in it, I would expect that to have a negative impact. Um, but if one host is a little faster or slower than another, I, I suspect that adding more, adding more nodes is going to get you more IOPS. It's going to be pretty hard unless you're talking like order of magnitude differences, I wouldn't expect adding hosts to slow things down. You know, probably. IOPS is probably your best. Almost everything about Ceph tends to be IOPS bound because of the way it breaks everything up. Um, it's very random. Like you look at the hard drives, they're all randomly seeking all the time. You stream big media file, the hard drives are seeking like crazy. Um, that is a big difference. When I was running MooseFS, the drives were much more linear. Um, you can also play around with things like allocation sizes and that sort of thing. Um, Ceph, the architecture's been moving more and more in the NVMe direction. In fact, they have a new um, storage model called C-Store um, that they're moving towards, which will be exclusively designed for NVMe. That's definitely the trend, um, but it works fine with drives. Go ahead. Oh, so that's all defined by a replication policy. So sort of the typical is 3x, um, so three replicas of things. Uh, if, and then the typical configuration, if you lose one, um, there's no negative impact. You're still you know, fully online. If you lose a second replica, in the typical configuration, the, dry, the, the data will go offline. So the data is still, it will still re-replicate, um, but you cannot, it definitely won't do writes. I'm not sure if you can even do reads on it in that state. And they do that because there's certain failure modes if nodes are coming up and down and you can end up with the, like a placement group where different blocks are in the master copies on a different server and you know, various failure modes. So basically, once you get down to one, you're essentially offline. Um, so you can typically lose two, but you can make that, yeah, you, know, you can make six replicas of a block, in which case you can lose five and be perfectly fine. Um, 
and then erasure co coding is the same. Um, you can run it like RAID 6, where you have two, two parity stripes. You can have five parity stripes if you want, in which case you can lose three copies and you're fine. Obviously, the more parity you have, the more disk space it takes. I can t I'm going to go ahead and we'll, we'll do a smattering of Q&A with a, a bit of show and tell. So uh, this is uh, the dashboard, which is part of what this is one of the things the manager module does. It provides this nice, pretty dashboard. It uses Prometheus internally. Uh, I think it actually might even run. Actually, no, I think it actually uses Grafana. Uh, I have it pointed at my, um, my cluster Prometheus, but it, it'll deploy its own if, if you don't have it. You can do things like look at all your disks. So you can see I have a mix of hard drives and solid state, and you can see how much storage there is. Um, you can look at pools, and you'll notice any one of these pools, I don't think it's, you can see the, the replication mode. So a lot of these small ones and my block store, which is, this is where all my persistent volume claims go, uh, are 3x replicas. And then a lot of my bulk storage is on CephFS, and that's erasure co coded. So 3 plus 2 means 3 data stripes, 2 parity stripes. So everything takes almost double the space. And uh, yeah, you get all kinds of pretty charts of I.O. and so on. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, so Ceph has a couple of thresholds, and these are configurable. Th this is actually a lot of distributed file systems have weird space approaching full behavior. Um, they're not, most of these things tend not to be as well behaved as like ext4 or something where, oh, you can use up the last block. Um, so typically it becomes read only after I think 90%. You can adjust the threshold, but it's kind of intended that you're doing that while the thing's rebalancing because you just added five new drives, not because you're going to kick the can down the road a month. Um, I, I would assume the defaults are safe. I'm actually well under that um, at the moment if you're doing a bunch of house cleaning, but um, you know, I, I'd probably run up to 70, 80 percent, you know, probably be I think that's probably what most people try to run. Yeah, so uh, this is the this is the danger of doing live demos, but I've, I've got a bunch of Grafana alerts set up, and there are Grafana dashboards defined for Ceph, uh, so it's real easy to just do a couple of clicks and you get all kinds of pretty... And I'm on the hotel Wi-Fi, not the self one, which might be a mistake here. Um, but. Basically, it's all exposed via Prometheus. Um, you also, you can use Loki to, you know, scrape things. There's, there's command line commands that will give you the, uh, the health of the net cluster and so on. I think what I was really trying to ask is, how do we know when it's done? Yeah, so I get an alert from Grafana. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm using Grafana for that. That was, there, except doesn't really have any, it's funny, which, uh, whose law is it that every application expands until it can eventually send email? Um, Ceph apparently has defied this. Ceph cannot send email, uh, so you actually need to have Grafana or something monitor it or some other log monitoring software. What's that? Traps? Yeah, no, so it'll, uh, it, it's got logging, it'll create Kubernetes events and, and so on, and there's, there's all kinds of Prometheus metrics that'll show unhealthy, you know, there's a, there's a lot of places you could trigger a, uh, an alert off of, but there's nothing, there's no alerting capability built into uh, Ceph. 
I, I mean, if you're using Grafana, you know, then I'd probably use Grafana. I mean, that's kind of what it's for, or Loki, you know, well, I use Grafana for Loki too, so. Yeah, if I, if I have a hard drive go down, I'm gonna find out because Grafana told me. Um, now, the default behavior in Ceph is like if a drive goes down, it'll give it like 15 minutes to come back, and then it will mark it out of the consensus, and all of its data will begin being re-replicated across the cluster. So as long as you have enough spare capacity, of course that eats into your capacity, which is one of those reasons you don't want to be at like 90%, um, but it will basically restore itself and go back to a healthy state just with less free space after some period of time. 